Good morning, everyone. And my name's Sharon Taylor. I'm the chair of the Cooperative Council's Innovation Network, and I'm very proud um, to uh, have done that role for a little while now. I'm very proud of the way the network is building. So um, welcome to our 2020 conference, uh, a very different conference from those we've had in previous years. Um, and we all know the reasons for that. So um, I'm delighted that we'll be welcoming probably over 200 um, members, officers and affiliates to our conference over the three days. We've got a very exciting program for you. Uh, and I'm very grateful to all those who have contributed to make it such an exciting program. Um, I did want to start, we lost uh, a very great friend of the uh, Co-op Councils Network uh, this year, that was Chris Herries. And I did just want to start our meeting by paying a tribute to Chris, all the work she did. She was a great cooperator, Chris, and she um, gave me and the other founders of the network enormous support when we started at this network going uh, a few years ago now. Um, she's a sad loss to the cooperative movement. Um, and I just wanted to start our meeting by paying a huge tribute to Chris for the um, enormous um, contribution she made to cooperation um, in this country and for the inspiration she gave to so many of us. She was a wonderful individual and we're, we're, she'll be a sad loss to all of us. So um, that said, uh, we move um, into our conference in very uh, unusual times this year. And um, firstly, I want to thank everybody in local government for everything they've been doing. Um, to support our communities. There is no doubt in my mind that local government has been the absolute shining star uh, of the situation around the pandemic. We have fed and supported the vulnerable in our communities. We've ensured that our businesses um, got the grants that they were entitled to and we've made sure that we supported business uh, with COVID secure ways of working. We've reassured our communities We've created safe spaces when we got to the end of, of lockdown so that people could move around safely in our towns and villages. We've made sure that the bins were emptied and the streets were swept and you can't underestimate the power of um, that, um, that presence on our streets every day. Um, we, I'm sure other councils would have had the same. In Stevenage we got hundreds of letters and gifts uh, from people who just said what a reassuring presence it was to see our staff out there, um, you know, emptying the bins, keeping the streets clean, all through uh, the, the difficult phases of the pandemic. Our staff have been incredibly flexible and have moved to virtual working quickly and taken on new roles uh, throughout the pandemic. So, uh, and then we've tackled a number of things that were unique to each community. Um, in my case, we had a huge spike in domestic abuse and we've, um, we've opened up, we've gone from two safe spaces for those fleeing domestic abuse to 16 in uh, a few short weeks. So, and we'll all have examples of that, uh, more of which we'll talk about later on this morning. And it's my view that our co-op values truly came into their own um, during this period. Uh, the cooperation um, that has taken place through COVID in uh, mutual aid groups across our community, focusing the real focus on community, um, a business linking in with our communities in new ways and different ways. And um, in, my, um, in my area, our uh, fantastic football club uh, opened up a, a sandwich service and they were taking sandwiches out to uh, our more vulnerable residents every day. And they said that they suspected quite often that the sandwich actually wasn't the key point of the visit, being, but being visited by uh, one of our first team footballers uh, was a great boost for everybody. So um, they, they, they linked in like that. And uh, when we launch our uh, case studies uh, book later on this morning, we show our councils living their co-op values values which as we come through the clear and present danger of the pandemic, and I know uh, so many of us are still very close to that, um, we're still using those values um, and localism to inform the recovery, to build back better uh, for our economies, job skills and infrastructure, uh, the community support which we're still uh, delivering and helping our communities to be resilient, the clear focus on uh, building back better for our environment, 
and the focus on mental and physical health and well-being. Um, we, as we build back, we've, we've looked at many of the programmes that our councils are bringing in for their recovery plans and we see some very clear strands of co-op thinking going through those and especially, uh, which we will be focusing on over the last, uh, sorry, the next three days, that, um, that will to tackle climate change and to build back not only better, but greener. So our co-op difference really reaches uh, out further than ever um, as we go into this um, recovery phase and as we support our communities, some of which are still almost uh, in lockdown, as we know. Um, it has the power to transform. We all know that. And I hope we're going to highlight some of the ways in which our councils are transforming things for their communities um, over the next three days. So I'm just going to give you a quick update on uh, the network and, and what we're doing uh, in the network. So um, the title of our conference today is Building Back Greener. Um, the, if I can have the uh, next slide, please, Chris. So um, this is where we are with the network at the moment. We currently have 77 members and 11 supporters. Now, um, you will have heard me and Nicola and Chris Pemberthy saying we are the fastest growing network in local government. We can't actually prove that, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Uh, but we're also the friendliest network in local government. And um, you see there we have 33 uh, full council members. We've got 17 associate members and we've got 27 affiliate members. And I'm very pleased that many of uh, those councils and affiliates are um, present for our conference over the next three days. So um, a growing network, a, a very supportive and innovative network, and really generating huge interest um, all across local government at the moment in the uh, way that we are carrying out our work, the way that we've supported our communities through COVID and the way that we're tackling the recovery. Um, next slide, please, Chris. So um, the reason uh, that uh, the network's attracting so much attention, just look at this list of councils that are in membership. We currently cover areas of the UK where 8.8 .8 million citizens live and the budgets, combined budgets of our councils are 14 billion pounds. We make a real difference um, with our co-op values out there. And we've been delighted to welcome so many new members on board during this year. Um, we look forward to welcoming. We've got um, some that are um, just about to join us, we think. So uh, we can't wait for those, uh, those new councils to join us and to tell you about them. But um, you'll see uh, both in our new case studies pack um, that we're publishing today and the, uh, the COVID work um, that we're publishing that all of these councils are really playing their part in delivering our co-op values right into the heart of our communities. Next slide, please. And here we have our associate members, uh, very important to us. And we are now uh, attracting membership from our town and parish councils. Uh, Nicola and I had a very productive time when we went to the National Association of Local Councils um, conference and exhibition. Uh, in Milton Keynes last year um, and we spoke to many many uh, town and parish councils and um, we were delighted to see that one of our councils, Woofton Community Council, actually won the, the Council of the Year at that conference and was um, and the members of Woofton Parish Council who were there, sorry Community Council were there uh, meeting Princess Anne and receiving their award and um, some fabulous examples of initiatives coming forward uh, from our, all of our associate members um, as they uh, develop their co-op practice and uh, take that into their communities. Next slide, please. And of course, we have uh, 27 affiliate members, um, affiliates who all uh, line up with our co-op values and are helping us to do so many of the uh, activities uh, both of the network itself but also working very closely with our councils developing um, the key initiatives that are driving uh, our work forward um, as we start to look at um, in a, a much more widespread use of things like community wealth building as we develop um, co-op practice in building co-op economies um, our affiliates are really sorry our affiliates are really key to um, supporting us and driving 
that work forward. So I'm very grateful to all of them. And of course, the, um, the network has uh, its governance arrangements uh, firmly in place. We have um, our executive oversight committee, which is the body that I chair. I'm grateful to all those members who serve on that committee. Um, we have created the action plan for the network and we work uh, through that action plan and we make sure that the contributions that our members give are, um, are dedicated to supporting the development of the innovative good practice that we see uh, right across the network. These, uh, these members give up their time very willingly uh, for our co-op network and I'm very grateful to all of them for the support they give me uh, as we move this network forward. Uh, from the early days when it was just a, a little um, glint in the eye of um, Steve Reed, uh, who we'll see on Wednesday, um, Jim McMahon from Oldham, uh, myself, um, we have developed the network now to uh, the way you see it today. But the governance of our network, it's very important that we govern this network in a way that meets our core principles and values. And uh, the Executive Oversight Committee um, helped me do that in, in the strategic management of the organisation. And then we also have our Values and Principles Board. Um, if you can put the next slide up, Chris, there's our Values and Principles Board. People from across the cooperative movement, from our councils, from the uh, trade unions, um, all there making sure that we keep to those, those values and principles that are so important. Um, in this network. So I'm grateful to all of you who serve on values and principles as well and some um, important key work that you've done uh, through the year in supporting the network. So that's our, our governance um, mechanisms. Um, so uh, as I said, we are uh, moving the innovation and good practice forward. I always find it fascinating when we were able to go and do conferences uh, in person that uh, we'd have our latest case studies books on our stands and um, people from across local government are fascinated by what the Co-op Councils Network is doing and those um, case study books literally uh, go like hot cakes on the stand. Um, we can't put them out quickly enough because uh, everybody in government is looking, local government is looking uh, for good practice and great ideas. Those great ideas are coming thick and fast uh, from our members and I'm very proud of that and of what we've achieved um, over the last uh, few years to drive that good practice forward and um, we'll move oh, we're going to move seamlessly I think now um, unless Nicola's going to shout at me and tell me I've missed something out um, into our first plenary session which is um, an action learning uh, session on cooperation through Covid. Um, I didn't know uh, when we started out on uh, the journey of producing this piece of work, whether we'd be able to do it quickly enough for um, to, to showcase it at this conference. It's a huge tribute to uh, our councils, our members and officers that they have been able to put together a fantastic um, e-book uh, where we can le all learn from each other about what's been going on uh, through the COVID pandemic. And um, we uh, we're publishing that today. Um, it does show how important our co-op values have been in supporting our communities as we've gone through this most difficult challenge. Uh, I've been a councillor for nearly 25 years now and this has been the most difficult challenge uh, I think any of us have faced. Um, but having that clear set of values and principles which guide our work I think have uh, really been key to the support that we've been able to provide to our communities. So um, we have a fantastic panel here today uh, to introduce uh, their own um, aspects of this cooperation through COVID-19. Um, I'll come on to the uh, how to get hold of the ebook um, when we get to the end of this session, but can I first introduce um, the fabulous councillor Ian Malcolm, who is the leader of South Tyneside Council who is going to take us through the action learning from South Tyneside uh, on cooperation through COVID-19. Uh, over to you, Ian. 
Thanks, uh, Sharon, and can, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. I mean, it's uh, really difficult when you do these things by by Zoom. Um, but thanks for those opening comments, Sharon, and it really is fantastic to see the Cooperative Council's network going from strength to strength. Um, I want to place on record my personal thanks to Nicola and the team for bringing this conference together, which I think is going to have more participants than the Lib Dem conference, and it's going to be longer <laughs> than the Conservative Party conference, and that's probably because we've got a lot more to, to say and engage with each other about. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to be speaking about my council's response and my community's response to COVID-19, because whilst local government generally, right across the country, whatever political persuasion you are, I think local government has stepped up to the plate and, and done a magnificent job in uh, really engaging with the public and protecting the public during this pandemic. I think if there is an assessment made, you'll find that it is cooperative councils who very much were first out at the starting blocks in engaging with their local communities and ensuring that there was a bottom-up approach in terms of supporting uh, neighbourhoods and so forth. I don't know if there are slides, uh, Nicola, if they are, I think you go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, just very quickly about me, I've been leader of uh, South Cancer Council since 2018. I've actually, I was actually first elected in 1988. I mean, when you look at me, I know it's incredible to believe because I look so young but I was elected in 1988, not 1998, uh, and I am chair of the Northeast Combined Authority. And for my sins, for about 15 months, um, I was one of the senior researchers and advisors to the Cooperative Commission, which became the Monks Report, which looked at the root and branch reform of the governance uh, structures of the cooperative movement in the United Kingdom. I've been asked in this session just to touch on the local context, and it's the next slide about South Tyneside, our response. And I know that the fabulous report, which is uh, being launched today, cooperation through uh, COVID, that, um, will be demonstrating a wide variety of different practices undertaken by councils across the country. My council on South Tyneside submitted two case studies, both of which have been referenced in the publication. One which is focusing on, on the involvement of the community and voluntary sector on South Tyneside through our uh, shielding hub, and the other one, the fab lab equipment at our um, National Centre for the Written Word, which was repurposed to help produce um, PPE. And then I want to touch just on promoting the community spirit through COVID. But very quickly, just for a minute or so, I'd like to just go through the local context because I always think when you're at conferences, listening to people speaking, I don't know about anyone else, but I always like to get the local context. Uh, South Tyneside is on the northeast coast. I'm sandwiched in between uh, Sunderland and Gateshead and um, about 13 miles from Newcastle. All of you will have seen my borough because it is home to the finish line of the world's largest half marathon, the Great North Run. And we've always been very passionate on South Tyneside about community involvement. And that's because following um, local government reorganization in 1973, we were very clear that we wanted to keep um, the local connections from the various councils that merged to become South Tyneside. And that's because they were very, very strong communities. If I tell you, for example, that Jarrow forms part of South Tyneside, where the uh, marches uh, came from, Hebben, um, the villages of Bolden, and of course, South Shields, which is the main administrative town in the borough itself. Very, very proud communities, and we always uh, devolved some decision making down to what was called community area forums, as well as significant um, amounts of cash for community involvement at a community level. And when I say significant, Sharon, you know, I'm talking about something like £400,000 every year is devolved to local communities for housing projects and environmental projects. My council is very big on community asset transfer, which is very important because of um, and, and became very important during the COVID pandemic. 
I'm, I'm a huge supporter of asset transfer. I always believe that community assets, when they're managed and run by the community, um, they feel ownership and they um, have great affection for their, their local services if they feel it belongs to them and it's not a service provided by the council. So if I tell you out of all of our community centres, 19 community centres across South Tyneside, they've all been asset transferred very successfully to the local community. And uh, our, all of our libraries, bar the, the main one in South Shields, have been uh, asset transferred to the local community. They've kept those facilities open for local people and local residents, but they've also enabled them to expand their services and also to apply for lots of grants and funny monies which local government couldn't um, uh, apply for. And that means that we have an even bigger pool of volunteers and community activists right across South Tyneside ready to help us when we need support, um, as has transpired during the, the pan pandemic. And of course, I'm absolutely tickled pink that um, one of the um, pluses of COVID has been that we haven't been able to go into a competition for the Cooperative Council of the Year, so South Tyneside by default is the Cooperative Council for a second year of running, much to uh, Tudor Evans' um, annoyance, I'm sure, but I'm sure you'll forgive me for that, but we're delighted to be the Cooperative Council of the Year. So look, just going into the, um, the body of the uh, presentation, South Tyneside COVID support the uh, support of or what we call the shielding hub this was brought about by a, a working group consisting of officers from the council from a range of disciplines and representatives of key statutory and voluntary organizations coming together around the objective of finding a way to support the local shielding population and to ensure that they had a single point of access where and could be promoted across the community in that it enabled people to access the right help from the right organisation in a timely way. It was additionally important, Sharon, that a solution could enable resources such as vehicles, kitchens and so forth to be effectively shared and that partners were able to share intelligence and made good use of the outreach mechanisms in the different communities to ensure that all of the groups in provision were well understood and no one was overlooked or left behind without support. And of course, developing uh, that hub across South Tyneside, we engage all of our volunteers groups, including Aid Concern, the Site Service, Blissability, Mutual Aid, and um, the Alzheimer's Society. The support hub was headquartered at one of our uh, leisure and library facilities, and it saw council staff redeployed from the, the temporarily closed leisure uh, centres into jobs such as call handling, food distribution, and welfare support. And a carefully scripted framework was established and implemented by call handlers to ensure people who were contacted, the single point of contact quickly received the required support they uh, needed. And it may have been a food parcel, it may have just been um, someone who was self-isolating and was a pensioner and needed their dog walking but they got that support from the local community. And over the time it was running, the Shielding Hood received over 21,500 requests for support. And if I tell you my council has around about 155,000 residents, you'll see that was a significant number of the population. 21,500 requests of support with many additional requests relating to food deliveries. That was over 5,000 uh, and many later requests relating to welfare support which was over 15,000. And the hub was supported by a recruitment drive of volunteers, by um, re recruited by both the Love South Tyneside ha hashtag, and of course the mutual aid group, which was established in uh, the borough. Partners who collaborated as part of the Shielding Hood project have continued to meet on a regular basis, even since the hub was stepped down, forming what we call a neighborhood development alliance focused on considering how collaboration can support residents to improve well-being, resilience, and independence post-COVID. The second- Ian, thing sorry, me. Ian, can I just, uh, sorry, it's my fault, but I forgot to let people know if they have questions, 
could they please put them in the Q&A box and we'll take the questions at the end because um, we um, because we've got slides on the screen it's difficult to take questions during the presentation so um, I'd be really grateful if um, uh, colleagues watching if you want to ask a question if you pop it in the Q&A box and we'll come to some questions at the end so um, thank you very much it's my fault Ian I should have said no no that. that's fine sure that's fine that's great and I'd, I'd look forward to answering any questions the second initiative which I just want to touch on briefly is the um, initiative where we involved local volunteers in the production of PPE um, equipment because we all know that at the early part of the national lockdown there was a shortage particularly for care homes, library, uh, library officers uh, recognised that there was an opportunity to use our mega space fab lab equipment which included 3D print printers in our um, central library in South Shields. And this project saw officers from my leisure teams and healthcare professionals come together to pool expertise. And basically what they did is the, um, the council procurement officers supported um, with acquiring the necessary materials, which were in high demand, so hard to find. And they actually created at the library, the visor frames, which, which were produced using easily available, environmentally friendly um, bioplastic and a partnership with local businesses secured additional elastic material needed for the fasteners. And as a consequence of that uh, initiative, over 1,000 face visors were produced through the scheme right at the very beginning, Sharon, when there was a real shortage of PPE equipment across uh, the country. And just turning to the fi to final side, um, all cooperative councils have got their own story to tell and they respond to the pandemic in the, in the best way in which they can bring their local communities together. And South Tyneside has used our hashtag Love South Tyneside social media campaign to mobilise volunteers and to celebrate the work of community members to help alleviate the challenges faced by local people due to the pandemic. We ask people to nominate their heroes and those that were nominated all received um, a personally uh, um, letter from the Mayor of South Tyneside and at the appropriate time we will bring all of those heroes together so that we can celebrate in the appropriate way. One challenge we did find, Sharon, just to end on this because I know other people need to come in, one challenge we did find is that right at the beginning of the pandemic people were very enthusiastic to volunteer and we had, and, and, sorry, and, and surprisingly, we had to dampen that enthusiasm because um, we had to be careful as a council that people who were going around offering support were uh, properly trained, were properly shielded themselves, and were actually responsible people. We needed to know who was knocking on pensioners' doors asking if they needed support and so forth, because there are some unscrupulous people out there, and the council does have a duty of care for all of our residents. And we basically got the COVID mutual group in to see Haley Johnson, who you be hearing from tomorrow, one of my key officers, where Haley was able to talk to them about how they uh, approach this in working with partnership with the council, not in any way trying to dampen that enthusiasm, but just trying to nurture and make sure that it was targeted in the right place and it was done correctly so that it um, protected them as individuals but also protected our residents who they were anxious to support so all in all whilst we've uh, been through a difficult time like everyone else i think south Tyneside, because of the strength of its community endeavors and because it was able to harness the support of its volunteer sector from a very early stage we really did manage to protect our local residents um, through the worst uh, times of this pandemic thanks very much Sean. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, great to hear about that fantastic uh, community activity in South Tyneside. And uh, you're right about the, the whole volunteer issues. I think that was probably an issue for all of our communities, making sure that um, we did have um, appropriate levels of training and um, clearance for those who were working with what were some very vulnerable residents, I think. Um, it's interesting to hear about that. And I also picked up your point about recognising those who have 
really gone the extra mile, uh, whether it's members of our own teams and our councils or members in the, out there in the community. We have our Pride of Stevenage Awards coming up uh, very shortly uh, and we'll, we'll be doing that too. I think, um, you know, councils across the country will be wanting to look at ways of recognising the really um, superhero efforts that people have gone to uh, during the, these difficult times. So thank you for that. Our next speaker in this uh, plenary session is um, a, a great friend of mine and a great um, champion of the environment. And that's Councillor Tom Hayes, who's the Deputy Leader of Oxford City Council. And Tom's going to give us uh, a perspective on cooperation through COVID from the Oxford point of view. Tom, are you on the line? There you are. Hello, Tom. Uh, nice to see Hello. you again. And we'll hand over to you for your presentation. Wonderful. Um, can I just start by saying how brilliant it is to be here? You're exactly right. The network is easily the friendliest network in the UK. So it's particularly great to be here. And it feels very strange to be having this kind of a session online. It was only a year ago that we were all bundled into Rochdale Town Hall, that kind of beautiful town hall um, where we met last. And it was because of that meeting that um, Oxford actually um, galvanised its uh, desire to become a member of the CCIN. And this year we joined. So we're very pleased to be a member. And we're particularly pleased that alphabetically we're next to Plymouth, so it looks like we're, ne we're next to the leading cooperative council in the, uh, the country. Um, so please don't allow any other councils to join that get in the way between Oxford and Plymouth and your infographic. Um, so just to give a, a bit of local background, Oxford is a university city. It's an old city. Uh, we, were, we achieved city status in 1542, um, but we're also a very young city. We're a university city, and so as you can imagine right now, we have a number of um, challenges that are facing the city council as we're trying to safely bring a university student population into the community. Um, and that's just one of the challenges we're facing because of the pandemic. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we responded in new and innovative ways, which tried to emphasize our cooperative values. So we delivered 10,000 food parcels uh, to vulnerable people by linking up with uh, Sophia, the uh, food poverty and food bank organization. We have also worked to deliver 27 million pounds in business grants through uh, the COVID-19 support for ratepayers. And within that, we've actually really tried to target the support to people and businesses that share our values. So where it's been possible to use the Bay's discretionary grant funds um, with some local freedoms, we've used them to support local businesses that demonstrate they pay the real living wage. And Oxford City Council was the first council to accredit to the Living Wage Foundation or the Oxford Living Wage, which is our own particular uh, variant on the living wage, which is £10.22 an hour and reflecting our cost of living within Oxford because we are an expensive city to live in. Um, through this, we've delivered uh, £1.4 million to 200 local businesses that have embodied our particular values, our social values. And these include social enterprises and other socially focused businesses, such as Cycle Repair Co-op, Broken Spoke uh, Co-op, which has received a grant, a £5,000 grant, which helped to keep it on its feet um, and to continue to support people to pursue active travel at a time when it was harder to get around by bus and public transport. Um, so we're really proud of the response that we've taken through the pandemic as a district council. And we've tried to, to not just put our economy back on its feet, support our businesses and jobs and to thread our cooperative values through our response, but to also respond to the pandemic in a way which meets the climate emergency. And Oxford City Council has been uh, doubling down in the last year on its already long uh, record of tackling the climate emergency. We're a city council which is uh, introducing the zero emission zone in Oxford next year, postponed from this year by the pandemic, which restricts polluting vehicles into the city centre. We're the home of Connecting Oxford, which is a programme that will introduce bus gates across the city and the workplace parking levy uh, borrowing from Nottingham so that we can fund the public service and bus uh, infrastructure improvements that are needed. So there'll be a new orbital bus service as a consequence of the workplace parking levy. We were the first UK city to hold a citizens assembly on climate change last year, which was wonderful. Stepping into it for the first time, I looked around and I saw people in there who would slam the door in my face if I knocked on their door to talk about climate. People who weren't within the usual uh, green campaign groups. And as a result of bringing together a representation of viewpoints and backgrounds, the City Council wasn't just given the impetus to go further and faster, we were also given really useful insight about how to do it in ways which mirrored people's needs to go further, 
but also was adjusting to their reality, their lived reality, so that we weren't forcing change on people, but working with them to deliberate. And we're also the home of Low Carbon Hub, which is a social enterprise that aims to create energy generation and supply within Oxfordshire, so that we're sending less money out of the county to the big six, who are mostly foreign owned and frankly run by oligarchs, and that we're producing community and cooperative uh, energy within Oxfordshire, so that people can actually be energy citizens. They can be shareholders, owners of their energy and beneficiary, beneficiaries of the renewable energy generated. And we're also the home of the Low Carbon Hub, which is a gathering together of all the big emitters in the city. Oxford City Council is responsible for just 1% of emissions. By gathering together all those emitters, we're able to use the language and the thinking of community wealth building. These are institutions that, that are anchored. They can't leave Oxford. The University of Oxford can't change its name very easily. Um, well, not if it wants to retain its uh, leading position. And so using that anchored institution language, we've been able to bring people together to commit to uh, really tough targets and tight timetables for delivering carbon reductions. So during the pandemic, it's been a time of adversity, but we also recognised that it gave us an insight into a new way of living, potentially. The roads were freer of traffic, which were not then belching out at carbon emissions or harmful emissions that affected people's health. The roads were also free of traffic, which meant that you could, for the first time, see some of the wildlife that had not been uh, quite so uh, listenable uh, during the normal times. And we also heard from our public who said that they really enjoyed a city which felt easier to get around on bike because there wasn't a concern about vehicles, particularly large vehicles on very narrow medieval roads, careening into people and knocking people over. So we were looking at the, um, the things that people were saying to us and thinking, how can we practically try to make some of this into a new normal? Oxford's not unlike many other cities uh, in the UK and around the world. We're facing three distinct challenges, which are the pandemic, the climate emergency, and the air pollution and road safety challenge that has been with us for a very long time. And we're meeting all of those challenges in a distinct but interrelated way, and we're doing it cooperatively and democratically. In terms of air pollution, over the pandemic, we saw a 59% drop in air pollution levels within Oxford, which is pretty unprecedented. Um, we'd seen a 26% reduction in harmful emissions since 2013 up to 2020. So to have a 59% reduction in a few months is absolutely unique. Um, that gave us a real sense of purpose to go even further. So we now have out to consultation a draft air quality action plan, which commits to uh, action which will achieve a new target for air quality. The government requires us to hit a particular target, but we don't think that's enough. We've been calling on government to tighten up their targets and to really double down and get on with the action needed to clean up people's air. Without that action coming from Whitehall, we're refusing to, del to delay. So we're setting out our own voluntary target, which is significantly stricter than the government's, and we're seeking to meet that through the introduction of the zero emission zone, and our connecting Oxford programme of bus gates and a workplace parking levy. Uh, we're also looking to celebrate Clean Air Day this week, uh, the postponed Clean Air Day, um, which usually happens uh, a few months um, earlier in the year, but it's happening on October the 8th. So we're working with children and young people to display the banners that they've helped to design in a contest outside of their schools to discourage their parents and guardians from driving to school, um, particularly on Clean Air Day, but we want every day to be a Clean Air Day. And we're also encouraging that if people do have to drive for mobility reasons, that they don't idle outside of the school. And that's a real collaboration with children and young people who are frankly going to be around longer than all of us and have got the, the most to suffer from climate um, change, but in the short term have a lot to suffer from air pollution, both in terms of their health. And as we see today from data released by the University of Manchester, their educational ability too. We also want to strengthen local communities. And so LTNs are something that we're actively encouraging the Transport Authority, the County Council to pursue. Uh, LTNs don't close residential streets. Um, that's the common misconception. What they actually do is open up people's streets like never before to a larger number and range of people than ever before. So residents, cyclists, pedestrians. And when neighbours can meet in the street, when children can play in the street, um, or be at a social distance at the moment, um, that's how you build a community. That's how you create and continue to sustain friendships. It's how you build civic belonging, civic pride and a local patriotism. So as a council that really believes in strengthening local communities, we've seen our transport measures as a way to do that. And then lastly, the climate emergency that I was talking about. 
as a council we unanimously declared a climate emergency and if we're to do more than just provide warm words which provide action then we need to take serious transportation measures forward because transportation is responsible for 16 percent of emissions so what have we done well first of all we've introduced one-way pavements to ensure that people can safely move around the city center we've got very narrow pavements because we've got very medieval streets um, we've also freed up pavement space um, so that we can encourage people to walk safely at a distance but also to make sure that we can reclaim some of the road space from private vehicles um, we've installed significant numbers of bike parking um, spaces at the park and rides around the city oxford is the first city in the country to have a sustained transport um, approach based on park and rides and by installing 130 bike parking spaces we're encouraging parking and pedaling um, working with the county council on their um, active travel fund we're seeking to bring money in to create segregated cycle lanes from the park um, rides into the city centre using the arterial roads so that it truly is completely safe for people to cycle into and out of the city we've also um, introduced free parking at our park and rides um, for a trial um, that lasted for a month and we saw a significant increase in the number of people using our park and rides as opposed to driving into the city we convened an inclusive transport group for which consisted of people with a range of physical impairments and mental health conditions and their representative groups because we recognize that in building back better we need to engineer a city which includes the voices of everybody and typically disabled people and physically impaired people are the people who are most excluded from decision making about the kind of space that we live and create and that group has been absolutely transformational in terms of our attitudes towards uh, decision making but in particular to the decision making that we take um, we've seen significant changes coming through as a consequence of the the group itself and we've reconfigured proposals in particular um, uh, reflection of what we've heard from that group we've pedestrianized streets so we pedestrianized a really key street in oxford called george street if people know it um, to support the hospitality sector to enable uh, customers to come in larger numbers um, during the pandemic obviously safe social distancing is key and so for the first time George Street really had a sense of a community in action people enjoying themselves people being safe and creating livable streets and we've extended that to other streets in the city centre too and um, for some of those trials we've extended them in time so they'll go on into next year and all the while we're capturing learnings and people's views about what actually works so for the pedestrianization of George Street, we just run a consultation, a survey, which saw a thousand people respond and 83% said that they would like to see the pedestrianization in warmer months because it had worked well for them. 74% said that they wanted to see the introduction of bolder transportation measures in the form of bus gates if it could lead to more pedestrianization. And in pedestrianizing, we've installed planters, which have been used by another social enterprise called Raw Workshop, which has the very snappy title, Doing Good With Wood. Um, and they involve young people and people who are newly out of prison or on probation in the design of those planters. So it's not just achieving the planters for the spaces, but also, as they say, social good. And we've also pushed on with the LTNs um, within the city. There are proposals for three, which are being worked up by the Transport Authority, and we're working closely with them as much as we possibly can uh, to make sure that those are successful. And we're also working with them to make sure that the other LTNs that they're um, bidding for um, from government to fund are going to be a success too. And I think it's a good point to, to kind of close on, on LTNs because we often see in the newspapers um, at the moment, this idea of a fierce debate between people who are pro-motoring, pro-motorists, and those who are pro-cyclists as if there's no middle ground, as if we can't meet in the middle, we can't talk about how motorists can be cyclists and cyclists can be motorists and indeed are, and how it's important that we air our differences and that by airing differences we reach a better place i mean to me that feels the very spirit of democracy which in turn feels the very spirit of cooperation it's not about pitting one against the other it's about creating a community of belonging within which everybody can play a part not having a transport system which is overwhelmingly geared towards the car when actually so few people in our city own vehicles and our motorists themselves so i think in that spirit of cooperation it's important to go forward to have that debate um, fiercely but reasonably and to reach a conclusion which can actually lead to bold transportation measures and that's particularly hard for the city council because i realize ccin is a organization an organization which is uh, non-party political and that's brilliant 
Um, my city council is a Labour city council working with the Conservative County Council. That county council is overwhelmingly rural. It doesn't have any elected members in the city. And so trying to find a way forward when actually there are so many differences feels to me the spirit of cooperation. We're putting that cooperation into action. We're trying to pull the best out for our city. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from fellow Labour colleagues, but also potential Tory colleagues about how we can go even further and faster and do that in that spirit of cooperation. Thank, Thank you, you, Tom. That's uh, brilliant to hear that all that uh, work going on in Oxford, uh, building on the uh, the definite in further interest on the in the environment that has been generated through the pandemic. You reminded me of uh, Rochdale last year and one of the highlights of my local government career, which was sitting in the seat that uh, they'd used to film Peaky Blinders, which was uh, fantastic. I'm a big Peaky Blinders fan, so that was great for me. Um, I uh, should say, I should say, Sharon, um, I'm particularly missing talking to the um, the ladies who uh, staffed the counter at the town hall because they had the best gossip about who the nicest Peaky Blinders actors were. Um, <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so um, you, you inspired me when I first heard you talking about your Citizens Assembly and we're just getting going with ours here. Um, I, I think your points about the gap between everybody that you speak to wants to tackle climate change and they all love David Attenborough and they want to crack on and get it done. And then when you get into the actual practice of um, things like low traffic neighbourhoods um, and uh, changing uh, high streets. Uh, there's, a, there's a slightly, the things kind of um, can bump up against each other, but our cooperative way of working and making sure that we do, um, we do discuss this, we have these debates, they can be uh, difficult, they can be challenging, uh, but it's important that we do that now and that we build on that great interest in the environment, in cycling and walking, in local food production, which I think, you know, people have been out on their allotments doing, doing their bit and uh, much more local food production going on um, in urban areas. Uh, benefits of, of less traffic and the great positive impact on biodiversity and wildlife. Um, I think we can really start to uh, build on that uh, even more than we had been before. So thank you for that insight from Oxford and what you're doing. We um, should, of course, this week have been in Telford uh, our friend, with our friends in Telford and Rekin. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can't uh, travel there. I'd love to have gone there. Haven't been there for a while. Uh, but we do have um, Councillor Ray Evans, the Cabinet Member for Finance, HR and Governance from Telford and Rekin, to uh, look at the resilience um, aspects of COVID-19 and how you've tackled that in uh, your lovely part of the world in Shropshire. Over to you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, and I'd just like to say, Tom, I'm from your part of the world and now I'm missing it terribly, even though I love Telford to pieces. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, develop developing community resilience. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, and I'm not going to be talking about um, what we're planning to do in the future, but a little bit about how what we did in the past has actually paid off. Uh, and the focus will be around our communities, the voluntary sector and our town and parish councils. So um, in stark contrast to Tom's area, we are a new town and two years ago we celebrated our 50th birthday, which was absolutely amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we have 100, around 174,000 residents in the area. Uh, next slide, please. But in spite of being a new town, we were actually the place that, where the Industrial Revolution began and started. Um, and 50 years ago, well, slightly more, uh, the, the residents of those communities, because Telford is made up of a number of very sm small villages and towns that were industrial, um, those residents were told, the new town people are coming and you've got to make it work. And so, interestingly, we kind of have a history of working together and working cooperatively. It's almost built into our DNA, I think, sometimes. Next slide, please. So, um, as an administration, uh, we came into power in 2011. Um, and right at the beginning, set out to be a cooperative council. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be part of the work that was done 
with our residents, uh, representatives, business communities, partners, and indeed staff, um, we set about uh, agreeing and developing our own cooperative values for the council, for the borough, for the staff. Uh, and these are they, openness and honesty, ownership, fairness and respect and involvement. And focusing back on those values kind of explains why a lot of what we had in place worked and worked well for us. Uh, and I'll just put it in here that one of the things that we've had very positive feedback about was the level of communication with our residents. Um, we felt that that was important, they knew what was going on, they knew how to contact us. And so some examples would be that our leader did um, a Facebook presentation almost every day during the lockdown, to just updating people, telling people what was going on, what we were doing. We sent out two personalised letters to all of our residents through that period and all of our residents can sign up to what I'll call e-blasts and so those were going out daily as well with updated information about COVID and our services. Uh, next slide please. So fundamental to the resource that we were able to uh, draw on during lockdown was our belief that our communities and voluntary sector organisations and the town and parish councils are experts in what they do. So let them get on with them and support them. Don't try and duplicate it. Don't try and get them out of the way. And, and to that end, we have put significant amounts of budget commitment, staffing commitment into enabling those organisations and that sector to work and flourish. Indeed, I mean, I sometimes have to explain that to some degree, we are now the CVS for, for the borough. Um, there is an organisation that used to be that and they're a service provider for something else. We're the CVS in effect. Um, and, and building on something that was mentioned one by one of the earlier speakers, some of the things that we have done and uh, did some time ago now was to transfer things like our libraries and our community centres to the communities and the town and parish councils so that they own them and they manage them in a way that enables the communities they're in to get the best out of them. Next slide please. <clears throat> so sitting underneath that is our, our belief that relationships matter. They matter in all our interactions um, and so we have invested um, in approaches to volunteering across the council. So that's within the council itself, we have um, volunteering opportunities for our staff and within the borough. Uh, and a little bit later on, I'll just show you some slides. We have um, a website that people can actually volunteer, find volunteer opportunities on. Um, we have quite a significant amount of grant funding that we offer to our voluntary sector either to start up uh, an organisation or to develop an organisation and we have very recently launched um, a database called Live Well Telford which is a resource for the voluntary sector to enable them to put their services out there and for users of those services to interrogate that database and find out what's available for them. So what we're about is building stronger and more resilient communities and that's what we've been about for the last 11 years. Um, so here we are, Here's, thank you for that. Um, this is uh, just a, a screen grab uh, of part of our website um, showing you that you know, these are the opportunities that um, volunteers can, can volunteer for but we also take the opportunities that the businesses offer um, and we match them up. So that's what some of the things that we're doing. We offer things like DBS checks to voluntary organisations. We support them all putting their governance together. So those voluntary organisations that we have out there are well organised, they're well constituted and hopefully are well funded. Next slide please. Uh, and also, I mentioned it earlier, we have our own team of volunteers and, and this team 
grew during the chapter at 50, and we call them gems, they're golden event makers. But they're there, they're a resource who are committed to us, and we were able to call on them as well. Next slide, please. So, COVID was not the first thing to hit us in 2020. You, I am sure, saw us on the national news for a couple of weeks, probably. Um, we had the River Severn lapping at our doors. And in fact, that second picture there, folks, is my house in the middle with the water line half halfway up the front door. Um, we had, it wasn't just one surge of the River Severn, it was two surges and they were almost at record levels um, for, for recent times. Um, so we had significant uh, numbers of staff working down in Ironbridge in Telford, um, supporting the community. But what was very evident then, thank goodness, was how well the community and businesses and the council were able to work together. And so we already knew that the resilience that we'd built in and the trust that we'd built in was working. So. As soon as that stopped, that was the end of February, yeah, we had COVID uh, as well. And I know our, our resilience manager was already working on it while he was down in Ironbridge sorting the flooding. Um, some of the things we're proud of is that the council recognised very early on that whilst there was government help available, it wasn't coming quick enough. Um, and so we were able to put a range of things in place, helpline offering, shopping, meals delivery, dog walking, prescription collecting, like a lot of you, I'm sure. Um, assistance with gas and electricity top ups, alongside with keep in touch calls, um, offering help to isolated people. We offered, I think, up to three months council tax holiday to our residents, and we put in place um, seven day a week uh, community support line and indeed another number of other support lines and at that point we were getting our voluntary sector involved in WAP as well. Next slide, thank you. So I won't go into the detail particularly of these, people can see it in, in our um, inclusion in the, the book, the new book, but our voluntary sector really rose to, to the call we had our, a church who asked us to support to enable them to get out to their members of their community and we were able to help them. Uh, Telford Crisis Support is our food bank in effect and we gave them additional funding to enable them to support our residents with meals. Some of our parish councils have community halls and kitchens. They, they developed a hot meal service for people who were isolated or had children and particular needs. The community itself came together to raise money for what we called Kindle Kindness, which was to provide Kindles for people who were either isolated in the hospital or in our old, old people's homes, um, so that they could keep in contact with, with their loved ones, but they also had something to read and entertain them. Uh, there's a, a picture of a colleague there, the Interfaith Council, delivering food and goods. Um, and our community centres hosted the food banks free of charge. So those are just some examples uh, of how our community came together. Uh, and I just uh, throw in here, um, whilst I'm focusing on the community, we didn't lose sight of our businesses either. We were one of the top performing councils in terms of getting the government business grants out. Um, the procurement policy notices allowed us to extend supplier contracts and to support our suppliers. Um, and the new powers that we've been given will be used to get local suppliers into the council supply chain, so supporting businesses that way. And we used the money that we got um, for adult social care to support our local um, providers. Next slide, please. So good things happen when you work together. We all know this, that's why we're here. Um, we were able to provide direct support, as you can see, to one in five households, recruited um, over a thousand community volunteer volunteers that were mobilized, worked with 80 voluntary community groups, actually established some new groups responding to the need, um, 
it strengthened the relationships. There's no doubt about that between communities, voluntary groups and ourselves. Um, and we have been able to identify new services that um, we can use going forward, particularly around social isolation. Next uh, slide, please. Nearly finished. Um, we've just done a resident survey. It speaks for itself. Our residents are very uh, happy with how we supported them during the pandemic and indeed how our leader, how our leadership was. Um, a peer review said this council has worked hard to establish strong relationships with partners and is seen to have moved up a level. Um, so moving forward, um, I just I won't go into the detail of that. We're going to continue what we're doing. We're proud of our voluntary sector. We're proud of what they do, and we will certainly continue to commit the resources to making it work. Uh, and there's just one final slide, which kind of sums tough it up for us, I think. Thank you. That's brilliant, Ray. Thank you so much for that insight into resilience. We know that uh, as well as the, you, you've reminded me actually, that as well as the COVID crisis, uh, many councils have been dealing with other things this year, including the floods that you referred to. Um, I, it's got um, a, an hour or so into a, a conference before I've said the B word, but we will have Brexit transition and a lot of our members will be dealing with aspects of that. Uh, we've got winter weather uh, issues still to come and we may have other outbreaks of, of flu and so on to deal with um, but it's our core values as you've uh, explained and the, the resilience we build in our communities that help to tackle all of those. Um, I'm not sure quite how the tech works in terms of time. I would like to take um, a couple of questions. Uh, Chris can you just advise me whether uh, it's, it's okay for us to run over uh, by five or ten minutes so we can take some of these questions or do we um, ask our uh, panel members to answer them in writing? Uh, yeah, five, five to ten is okay, I think. Lovely. Okay, so we've got some really interesting questions that have come up in the chat box. First of all, thank you for brilliant presentations, all of you. Um, when, uh, when you get um, the ebook that we've produced, um, there are about 28 case studies in there, I think. Um, but I know every one of those is matched by dozens of, and dozens of others from uh, around our council base. So if you've got more, do, do let us have them. We, uh, the first question was from Rob Gregory, who's from Stevenage. And um, Rob was asking, uh, how can we share with the wider public sector this uh, cooperative new normal that we seem to be developing now uh, amongst our councils? Um, I think that's a really uh, key question. I'm going to give you the questions, then I'll come to each panel member. Uh, who can respond uh, to uh, the questions. Some of them are directed to you individually. So, um, Tom, one for you from Lizzie Collins from Lancashire County Council. What would be your number one ask for your count from your county council in terms of developing your agenda? Um, one for uh, Ian in South Tyneside from Paul Stewart. How are you galvanising that volunteer effort for the future? Ian in South Tyneside so you build on uh, the uh, momentum you've got going there and uh, one from Sue Woodward um, who uh, has asked Ray uh, how you're developing the support for uh, parish and town councils um, as you um, as you develop your program to um, use what uh, you described and she's quoted you uh, the experts uh, on the ground there so um, if I, um, I'll come to Tom first for the question about Lancashire, uh, about from Lancashire County Council about uh, what will be your number one ask from Oxfordshire County Council. I think I would ask for political bravery because I think that underpins everything um, that the County Council could potentially deliver. It's, I mean, it's re just really frustrating to see a transport authority at a time of opportunity choosing not to go ahead with some key changes and using the need to consult and um, engage um, as a reason, as a deflection from taking action. What I said earlier was that we ought to have democracy, we ought to, ha we ought to have real consultation. People need to be able to share their views because they know their streets better than everyone. But the bravery comes in at the next step. Dialogue has to be closed down to a decision. We're in local government to take decisions. And if the county council isn't prepared to take the decisions, having march the public up to the top of the hill and then march them all the way back down that's a real problem not just for delivering the changes we need but for retaining people's trust in local politics we've seen local government skyrocket in terms of its trust levels among our public because we have been seen in recent months 
to do the very best by our citizens. And so to have a local council potentially undermining all of that is really depressing and I would call for political bravery. Okay, thank you. Um, I want Hertfordshire County Council to make us a sustainable transport town so we can get on with the job. So uh, that would be my one, the number one ask of Hertfordshire. Um, so Ian, uh, Paul's asked you how you're galvanising your volunteer effort for the future for South Tyneside. I mean, one of the things we um, have found, Sharon, of course, is that the volunteers are getting younger. Normally, volunteering is for people who are retired, um, you know, have retired early and so forth. And what the community groups are saying to me is we're finding people who are in their 30s, their 40s, sometimes in their 20s, who are popping along and are wanting to get involved. So we're harnessing, we're harnessing that by sort of bringing together the neighbourhoods with the Neighbourhood Development Alliance. We've continued our dialogue with the Mutual Aid Group coordinator, who has a database of volunteers, and we're looking at how we can utilise them. Now, of course, like all councils, we're under financial pressure, so a lot of people are interested in uh, developing and looking after their neighbourhoods, particularly their parks and so forth. So there are, Sharon, a lot of friends of the parks groups being established right across the borough. And the council is now developing a protocol in which all, in a framework in which all of them can operate um, under the tutelage of the council, but, but as volunteers. You know, I'm reminded by Michael Bloomberg, who was the mayor of New York, who said in the city of New York, I have about five million, I think it was five million volunteers. And it's important to harness them so that they're doing what the corporate centre feels is a priority and needs to be done without them feeling that they're being coordinated because they're volunteers and they just want to get on with it without some sort of control from the centre. So we're definitely building that up, um, Paul, and looking at the type of resource that we can give uh, and so forth. Just to touch on Tom's point, we're very fortunate on South Tyneside that we don't have a county, a county council. Um, so what we've done is we've had that good regional working with the seven local authorities in the northeast, including um, a conservative controlled Northumberland County Council, where we've been really working closely to coordinate messages and our response to the pandemic and our asks of government. And that's worked really well, Sean. Yeah, I think there's been some really good uh, cross working across tiers, uh, across regions uh, through the pandemic and, you know, um, the, the uh, cross party working yeah. uh, where people have all focused on the community uh, has been really, really good, I think. Um, over to you, Ray, on Sue Woodward's question about support for parish and town councils in Telford and Reakin. How have you been um, galvanising and supporting your parish and town councils? Oh, it's an interesting thing because I think they are, they do it the other way around. Uh, and I have been a, a parish clerk in a, in a different area, and and I know how different our town parish councils are. And I think it's something to do with the respect that they know we respect them, and that we're both in it to make it work. Um, and a lot of that's down to officers. A lot of it's down to the fact that we've got a lot of dual-hatted councillors sitting on town and parish councils. Uh, and we don't have a tier in the middle. So, in effect, our town and parish councils are what used to be a district council for us, I think. We, um, we share services, we will sell them services and tailor those packages to what they want. So, we have environmental maintenance packages that we have offered in the past and they buy into it and we enhance it. So where we're asking them to take on something, we will offer them financial support and officer support. The libraries, if they wanted to take on the library, got three years worth of funding to, to manage that process. And they know they can come to us and get answers. Um, and we're flexible with them. We also have a, a parish charter group where we meet with them and we talk about the issues, we update them. Um, and there is a clearly defined responsibility at cabinet level as well for town and parish councils because they are important. So I think it comes down to respect, sharing and a common purpose. 
Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, that's a great insight. I don't have any town and parish councils in Stevenage, and we've had this big debate in Hertfordshire uh, about unitary government and what happens if we have it. And 51% uh, of our county doesn't have any town and parish councils. So we're, I'm very interested in uh, how that how that all works. Um, now, um, Rob Gregory's question. I think I'm going to use that shamelessly, Rob, as um, uh, uh, as to promote what we're actually doing with this uh, ebook that we've produced today. Um, you can, uh, I think that's the answer to your question about how we create this cooperative new, new normal. There's been huge, vast interest in the work of our network. And I think promoting the work that our councils do and how, you know, we want, to, we all of us want to see this cooperative way of working, whether we're talking about uh, the way that translates into the economy, the environment, our communities, uh, social aspects, health and healthcare. We want to see that cooperative new normal becoming everybody's new normal. Um, and the way of doing that is to promote what we're all doing. Um, Nicola has just posted the link to the ebook um, in the uh, chat uh, line on this call. And um, do share and share and share that ebook. You will find people are fascinated by it. And um, what the best thing we can do is talk about uh, the fantastic things that everybody's doing. You've all been doing that this morning. I'm massively grateful to our uh, first panel uh, of conference. It's been lively, it's been diverse and very, very interesting and shown the, uh, the resilience, the focus on community, the focus on the environment that our councils have shown. But read the book, there's loads more in there. Thank you so much to Ray, to Tom and to Ian.